Hi, I am Dr. Chip Meyer with Field Medical Affairs at Otsuka Pharmaceuticals Development and Commercialization. Today I'm going to present a brief overview of the neurobiology of opioids. Oftentimes there's confusion among the terms opiate and opioid. Opiates are the naturally occurring alkaloids from the opium poppy, such as opium, morphine, and heroin, among others. At one time, opioids used to refer to synthetic drugs that produce similar effects as opiates. However, now the term opioid is used more broadly for all compounds that work at the opioid receptors. Thus, opiates fall under the term opioid as well. The use of opium dates back to around 3400 BC, and opium was used for many medicinal purposes, including treating cough, diarrhea, vomiting, and spasms, to induce sleep, as well as to relieve pain. It wasn't until the late 18th century that the addictive properties of opium were realized. And then in the early 19th century, morphine and codeine were isolated from opium. The addictive properties of morphine were just as misunderstood as opium, and morphine was actually used as a treatment for opium addiction. This led to further narcotic addiction, as morphine is about 10 times more potent than opium. By the late 19th century, heroin was synthesized from morphine, and once again, the addictive properties were underestimated. Heroin was imported into the U.S. shortly after it was introduced and was used as a cure-all for a range of conditions. It was also branded as a safe and non-addictive alternative to morphine. But by 1925, there were 200,000 heroin addicts in the U.S. The Controlled Substances Act of 1970 led to the classification of heroin as a Schedule I drug which is a drug with no currently accepted medicinal use and a high potential for abuse. Synthetic and semi-synthetic opioids have been developed to treat pain, such as fentanyl and other commonly prescribed pain medications. These medications work as agonists at the mu opioid receptor and have become an important component of pain treatment. Opioid receptors are located within the CNS as well as the peripheral tissue. Endogenous opiates, which I will speak to shortly, normally stimulate these receptors. Mu opioid receptors are located within the brain stem and medial thalamus, and these are responsible for supraspinal analgesia, sedation, respiratory depression, gastrointestinal motility, and physical dependence. Kappa opioid receptors are also located within the brain stem, as well as in the spinal cord, limbic, and diencephalic areas. Kappa receptors are responsible for spinal analgesia, sedation, dyspnea, respiratory depression, and dependence. Lastly, we have the delta opioid receptors, which are not as well studied as the mu and kappa receptors and are located largely within the brain. Delta receptors are also responsible for both spinal and supraspinal analgesia, gastric motility, and psychomimetic effects. In terms of the addictive properties, it is the mu opioid receptor that is responsible for euphoria, while the kappa and delta receptors are responsible for dysphoria and dysphoric effects. As for the locations in the periphery, opioid receptors occupy sites within the vas deferens, the knee joint, the gastrointestinal tract, heart, immune system, as well as others. In discussing opioid receptors, a fourth receptor, the nociceptin receptor, is sometimes named due to similarities with classical opioid receptors. However, due to its lack of response to opioid antagonists, many consider it a non-opioid branch of the opioid receptor family. As far as the mechanism of opioid receptors, they are G-protein coupled receptors with effects mediated by both neuronal opioid receptors and opioid receptors within the immune cells. On the left, we look at activation of neuronal opioid receptors by an opioid. This leads to the disassociation of G proteins into alpha and beta gamma subunits, which are free to interact with target proteins. The alpha subunit inhibits adenylocyclase, cyclic adenosine monophosphate formation, and protein kinase A activity. This blocks various ion channels, including the transient receptor potential cation channel B1, hyperpolarization-activated cyclic nucleotide-gated ion channel, acid-sensing ion channel, and voltage-gated sodium channels. The beta-gamma subunit blocks voltage-gated calcium channels and transient receptor potentiation cation channel M3, and activates G-protein-coupled inwardly rectifying potassium channels and adenosine triphosphate-sensitive potassium channels. 
Together, these actions result in a decrease in neuronal excitability, culminating in analgesia. On the right, we look at activation of opioid receptors within immune cells. Activation of leukocyte G-protein coupled opioid receptors lead to beta-gamma mediated activation of phospholipase C and production of IP3. This activates IP3 receptors in the endoplasmic reticulum to release intracellular calcium, resulting in secretion of opioid peptides from immune cells. The released opioid peptides activate neuronal opioid receptors and decrease pain. Now that we know how receptors work, what are the opioids that bind them? We will first start with the endogenous opioids. Endogenous opioids are derived from pro-hormone precursors, can function as neurotransmitters, and may re be responsible for home hormone secretion, thermal regulation, and cardiovascular control. Met and Lou encephalon are derived from proencephalin. They are agonists at the delta receptor and mainly involved in lowering pain. Dynorphin A and B are derived from prodynorphin, and they are agonists of kappa and modulate pain. Beta endorphin is derived from pro melancortin and is an agonist at mu, kappa, and delta receptors. Beta endorphin is responsible for reducing stress and maintaining homeostasis. And lastly, we have endomorphin 1 and 2, which are agonists at the mu receptor, and no precursor has been identified for them. The roles of endomorphin 1 and 2 are undetermined, but are thought to be important in pain relief. Lastly, we will discuss the opioids we hear most about today. We are going to start at the top with the opioids with the highest risk of abuse and work our way down to the antagonist. At the top of our list is heroin. As previously mentioned, heroin is a Schedule I drug with currently no accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. Heroin is rapidly metabolized into morphine. Next, we have fentanyl, a synthetic opioid. Fentanyl is an agonist of the mu opioid receptor and used as an analgesic. It is a Schedule II drug, meaning it has medicinal use, but also a high potential for abuse. Morphine, an opiate, is also an analgesic and Schedule II drug that is an agonist at both the mu and kappa opioid receptors. Methadone is a long-acting synthetic opioid. It is often used for moderate to severe pain as well as to treat opioid addiction. It is also a Schedule II drug due to its high potential for abuse. Buprenorphine is a semi-synthetic opioid as it is derived from the naturally occurring alkaloid of opium, thibin. Buprenorphine is a partial agonist at the mu opioid receptor as well as an antagonist at the kappa opioid receptor. It is also used to treat pain, but is more commonly known for its use in opioid addiction treatment. Buprenorphine is a Schedule III drug, meaning it has medical use and a moderate to low potential for physical and psychological dependence. At the lower end of our table here are the antagonists. Naloxone and naltrexone are both antagonists at mu, kappa, and delta opioid receptors. Naloxone is used to rapidly reverse the effects of opioid overdose. And naltrexone is used and the treatment of opioid addiction to block the effects of opioid medications and street drugs, and can also help decrease the desire to take opioids. As they are both antagonists, the risk of abuse is relatively low, and they are not scheduled narcotics. This concludes our brief overview of the neurobiology of opioids. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and I encourage you to check out the other presentations in this four-part series on PsyQ.org. You can also keep up with PsyQ on the go by checking out our Twitter and LinkedIn or by subscribing to our YouTube channel or podcast. Thanks and have a great day.